So what are we trying to do with this workshop? So it's really to provide guidance for FBIP proposals. So the, the FBIP is quite a unique um, funding program. It's a little bit different to the normal NRF um, programs. And so we want to give some guidance. But I think some of the points are also useful for other proposals, for proposals beyond the FBIP. So from our perspective, we really want to improve the quality of proposals so that we can allocate all the funds available in a way that delivers on the program commitments. So we have had problems um, allocating all our budget because we get a lot of proposals, but they're not uh, always in scope or they, not, um, they don't really address our specific needs for the FBIP. And uh, that's a, a problem for us when we've got money and we can't, we can't allocate it. But we also need to ensure that the grants are spread across researchers, institutions, age groups, races, genders. We don't want to have a little clique of people who monopolize this funding. So we want it really spread out also across different taxa and different aspects um, of biodiversity. So what we're going to be doing, Lita will have um, circulated the agenda. This is just a higher level overview of what we're going to do. I'll just give you some background and some of the requirements for the projects for big and small grants. And then what we're going to focus on today is really focusing on why projects fail. So what are the big um, stumbling blocks for proposals that are submitted? And this is based on our experience over the last few years. Um, so these two big areas, it's the scope, it's the outputs and the impact of projects, and then it's also the feasibility. So we're going to look at that, we're going to do some group exercises, and we're going to just um, review some of the key points, and then we'll just close. So as we're going through, um, I'll pause and you can ask questions. You can either um, put them in the chat box or you can put up your hand. I can't see the hands um, on my screen, but Lita will keep an eye out. Um, so do ask questions through the, the presentation. It's, you know, it is um, supposed to be quite interactive. Uh, let's see. Okay, so so this graph shows um, our challenges. So since we started awarding um, grants in 2013, we've had about 491 applications, and we funded 156 projects. So it's only a 32% success rate. Um, and you know, in 2017, it was. Um, we had 72 proposals, we funded 23 of those. In 2018, it was 19 out of 65. 2019, nine out of 22. And in 2019, the NRF introduced their new one call process. And so the, the number of proposals dropped really radically. And then last year, um, we actually had two funding rounds. So one in, I think we did, um, it was probably in May and then another one in September. So we had 60 proposals and we funded 19 of them. So it was a 32%. So it's about a 32%. And you can see there's three institutions that we get most applications from. That's the ARC and Stellenbosch University and the University of Pretoria. Um, and, you know, you can see the, so the dark bar, dark part of the bars are the number of successful proposals and the lighter color is unsuccessful. So, yeah, you can see the museums, I lumped them all together, all the museums, they have quite a high success rate, about 50% success rate. So that's um, the situation. We not we don't have a very high success rate, and we would like to be able to allocate all our budget. Sorry, oh, I'm struggling with my <laughs> click. Okay, so for the FBIP, 
it was set up. We started um, developing the proposal for it in about 2011. And the intention is to generate, manage, and disseminate foundational biodiversity information as the basis for research that can catalyze the bioeconomy and for decision making, which will promote human well being. So there's two themes global change and the bioeconomy. And I'll look at those in a little bit more detail. We've got two funding streams. We've got large grants. So these are large team projects, three years, 500,000 to one and a half million a year. So maximum total of four and a half million. And the process is that you submit a concept document and if it's successful, then you develop the full proposal. And we fund one or two of those a year. So this year, we can actually fund two big projects um, if, if we get two that are good. Then the small grants, these, they used to be one-year projects. We've now extended them and they're two years. And that was just because people were struggling to finish the project in a year. Um, and they're 250,000 Rand in total. And that has also been increased. It was 200,000, it's now 250. And um, the, this year we've got funding to fund about 20 of those small grants. So what does the FBIP cover? It covers two things, knowledge generation and mobilization of existing data. So for knowledge generation, this is the discovery, description, and identification of taxa. Surveys of areas or taxa of strategic importance, that's occurrence data, and or population abundance data. And then there's also phylogenetic or population genetic diversity, including DNA barcodes, which enable distinction and identification of taxa. And then mobilization of existing data, it can be data capture or digitization of specimen data. And also uh, compiling species information um, according to, we've got some standards for that and it's the Encyclopedia of Life requirements. So that sounds like quite straightforward, but there's a lot of other specifications. So a lot of other details. So you can do all of those things, but what it has to produce, whatever you do for FBIP projects, it has to produce occurrence records. So that's the species name, collection, locality, date of collection, maybe also the number of, of individuals. Um, DNA barcodes, and that's according to the eyeball standard, and those must be submitted to BOLD as part of the barcode reference library. And then species pages, this is consolidated information about species, images, description, biology. And the reason why we have to have those three outputs is because when we set up the FBIP, it was to cover agreements that South Africa has with GBIF, with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and with the barcode of life, the international barcode of life. And then we wanted to get a, an agreement with the Encyclopedia of Life. It never really happened. Well, we did actually have one initially. Um, but, you know, DST said that they were DST at that stage, science and technology. They didn't want uh, fragmented programs. They wanted integrated programs. And so the FBIP was really set up to serve our um, international associations with these three initiatives. So if, we, if we're not um, aligning with these, then this INR, Science and Innovation, could question the FBIP. So the other requirements, this is for both the large and small grants. The research must focus on South African biodiversity, and that includes Prince Edward and Marion Islands. And funding can only be provided for field work within the boundaries of the country. 
So sometimes if you're doing a taxonomic revision, you might be working on a group that has representatives from other countries, and that's fine, as long as the bulk of species are in South Africa. But we can't fund field work to other countries. And then another requirement is that the data must be submitted to the FBIP at the end of the project funding period so that it can be made publicly available. So this is also um, something that we realized quite early on is that there are lots of research projects that are done, but the data just disappear. So they stay on somebody's computer and eventually are just lost. And we keep, we, having, we have to keep repeating the collection of data because data just disappear. So we want it to be um, sort of permanently deposited and then also made accessible. So the data flows into GBIF mostly, um, and then the grant holders are, you know, also if they're doing barcoding, it has to go into bold. Um, also the curation of samples. So we've always said that you need to, if you're collecting material, it must be deposited into one of the museums. And now we're also saying if you've got DNA samples, um, those should go into uh, a biobank. So those, those specimens or that those samples should be openly accessible to others. So it's the same. We spend a fortune on going to collect material and then it just disappears or extracting DNA and then what's left just gets thrown away and somebody's got to go and recollect it. So university collections, and I think the exception is herbaria, but the collections are usually not openly accessible. Um, and so you should look at collections that are accessible. For the big projects, the large team projects, um, three years, like I said, these have to fit into one of seven themes. So these can be multi tax surveys where the geographic area is very clearly identified. And that's where that area may be threatened by large scale development um, or an area with that where we just know very little um, and it's not included in spatial plans. Or it can be a survey of the biodiversity of a particular habitat or biome that is neglected and very important for ecosystem services. And that must be over a wide geographic area. So things like soil habitats or wetlands or urban environments, where these are really important systems, um, those could be, could be surveyed. Then the third one is a crop wild relatives. So this is the taxonomy and distribution of crop wild relatives in South Africa. Uh, crop and livestock pests, parasites and disease vectors. So focusing on indigenous taxa, documenting and describing what, what these are, understanding their distribution and changes in distribution. Then the fifth one is, is more about human health. So vectors of disease, parasites, pathogens, and allergens. The documenting the, the diversity and looking at changes in distribution and predicting future spread. The sixth one is the cultural significance of biodiversity. So this is something that's being quite um, sort of neglected from the biodiversity side. Uh, so looking at you know, the um, different cultural values of biodiversity. And then the seventh one is taxonomic revisions of priority South African taxa. So this is really to where we've got a big group um, that needs a lot of uh, work, taxonomic work, that could take many years. And what we're saying is rather um, get a big team together, invest all your time, take four and a half million and sort it out quickly and efficiently. But it must be a group that's economically or ecologically important. 
So, you know, the, the kind of thing that I would be thinking here, and it may not be feasible, but something like the mesomes for one of the plant groups. Very high endemism, really important, um, but lots of taxonomic problems. Could take 20 or 30 years to sort it out by then, how many species have we lost? Right, so those are the large themes, the large project themes. For small projects, um, they don't, fit, don't have to fit into one of those themes, but they must fit into the broader themes of the bioeconomy or global change. And these small projects are not just any projects that have some relevance to bioeconomy or global change. They must be strategic projects. They must produce data or knowledge that's needed by someone. And they must produce at least one of the target outputs. So one of those three, so the barcodes, the occurrence data, um, or the, the species pages. Obviously, the more that's produced, the better. 